Yeah, it's still a dang hot ticket, certainly. All right, other questions? I think we're going to get into some more of the code. Uh, one of the things that I am dearly interested in is that as we would uh, put together uh, code, there's not going to be a lot of interference. Uh, one of these next concepts that we're going to bring out here is the thought of closures. We don't want there to be pollution of, from one variable declared, let's say, on the uh, global scope, like x is currently. I said that it was equal to taco right now. I don't want that to interfere maybe with another variable, which is called x, inside of other pieces of code. So in JavaScript, in the world of JavaScript, the entire way that that is covered is with functions. How do we get there to be something that's separate from another? Ah, it must then live inside of a function. We'll see that that's entirely useful. As we move forward, we'll also get onto a web page, a few controls out there, and like just 10 of them, buttons and such, make it like a little calculator thing. And as you were to depress one of the 10 buttons to indicate a number and such, well, wouldn't it be obnoxious if it somehow wouldn't be able to, uh, to know which of those numbers it is? And we'll find that closures will help us there as well. This is a programming construct that in JavaScript I would feel is mission critical. Uh, to, to set the stage about this, a anybody have seen closures so far and understand a bit about how that, uh, how that works or the functional scope inside of JavaScript, those concepts? Uh, maybe some of you are like, wow, okay, we're going to jump into an intermediate topic. I hope it's not intermediate, actually. I hope it's like just widespread understood, honestly. I hope you don't get too bored then for those who might have seen. I hope you don't get too bored with this presentation. Let's go ahead and put together a function then. I would invite you to follow along if you would wish. And some of this code I will be um, shipping out then in an email. We'll see if we can get some of this uh, code out for you cats after the session is all done. Consider that we have the variable x still kicking around. If I ask what x is, it says it's a taco. Cool, so it knows. Clearing the screen with just command K on this Mac or control L on a um, Windows machine or a Linux box or the Ghostbuster symbol, you can clear the thing with that. So, clean slate there. Uh, let's say that we have uh, a function that is uh, add a number and then we would take in this, let's say, a number which is x. And this is very similar perhaps to some of the code that you might have seen then in the video a little bit ago for those who had pre-gamed on this thing. Let's do a console log of whatever x is plus 5. And then let's go ahead and close that off. Now what in the world is a console log? That might be new. There's an object called console. And then of course, as you see then, an ability to log, but also then to show error messages as well. So it's very frequent that we might want to then log things on this then. In defining that function, is it something that has run yet? is not run yet, but it's something which has the potential to run, so that's important. If I say then add num, and then I just put in the number 10, all right, it barfs back for me 15. That console log is a thing that had chosen to write out to the screen that x plus 5 idea. Well, from that, let's see, could we make a function get defined and run immediately, perhaps? Let's see what that might look like. So we have a function. It's called add num. Now to get this, what I had done is simply done the up arrow a few times there, put a space. And if this is defining for me something which is called add num, I mean, could I actually say that uh, var my function is equal to all of that mess? And if I were to do that, actually, could I have not even had to have named it potentially? Ah, okay, so that's a different format by which we can define a function. Let's see both of those formats. Now, if I said my func of 15, okay, it bars back 20. So sure enough, it really is working in a similar sort of a way. Seeing both of those ways, there was this way, where we say some name is equal to what we might term to be an anonymous function. I mean, left to its own devices, it doesn't have a name. It's unnamed, it's anonymous then. There's not like the add number thing that I've, that text wasn't there. But here I'm just then saying, all right, create this function and then put it into a variable. And then that variable essentially is then holding on to 
that function. The other way by which we define, as you remember perhaps, and we just call it and say function add none. You know, technically, right here, I should have put a semicolon because we're saying that something is being assigned to something else. This idea of my func is being assigned to a function. If that is happening, we are setting, we are assigning a, val a value of some kind, and then anytime I have that, I need, if it's a statement as such, I need a semicolon at the end to be able to indicate, all right, this is a whole idea, and the semicolon indicates I'm done with that idea at this point. If we look now at add num and ask what is it, it knows about its innards, or if we similarly would want to ask about my func, then it also has exactly the same idea. So they are completely equivalent to one another. They in fact have been defined out here, I don't, I'm not like inside of any other functions defining. Wouldn't that be a mind-numbing thing? Is it actually possible to find one function inside of another function? That's where closures get powerful. So we're just gearing up. So uh, just gearing up to the thought that we could A, define a function and immediately run it. And we don't even have to have a name upon it to be able to do that. That's totally cool to do that. Or B, we could have a function that builds another function and returns it for us. What if this word closure is a function and another function, like a Firebase kind of function? It's, that's a specific use of closures. The concept itself is more generic just to indicate this will enclose variables that I would like to utilize. But the real use case would be that. It would be, I want to generate something that is holding onto values for me and then be returned that for, uh, for people to utilize. That's entirely what that is. All right, so this has been fun. Hopefully those two are not too mystifying for us. We've defined them in a couple different ways. We've seen that there's an honest one that's possible. Let's now do the exact same thing, but then immediately run it. And so I'll just say, in fact, I'll, I'll steal the, the code that I had used right here, the somewhat a little bit more simple code that had made this add num, and I'm gonna take away, so it doesn't even have a name, but I'm gonna put the whole enchilada in parentheses, and then we might say that thing is exactly equal to a function. If I press enter, that's all it knows about, in fact. You've just told me about a function, you didn't run it, there was code that could run, it was prepared to be able to run, but it didn't run it yet. All right, well with that, what if I go to the end of that guy, and you know, how do we run functions? I had said add num and then what punctuation to be able to say I want to run this thing. The parentheses. parentheses. Parentheses indicate if I have a name of something and some parentheses, then as long as it's not a keyword like if or for or something else like while or something like this, as long as it's not a reserved word inside of uh, JavaScript, what that always is is I'm going to try to run a function. Like if it's just add num parentheses, what that is absolutely meaning is try to think that add num is a function and try to run it like a function. If I just, like, x and add num are both just variables. So we have only just simply applied uh, x is equal to an integer and add num, or it's a string, I mean, and then add num is equal to a function, that's it. They just are names that point to objects, that's it. One of them just happens to be code that can run and one of them just happens to be a string, that's it. All right, uh, if I were then to say add num and parentheses, we know that that will try to run it. Well, x not being a function, if I try to run it with some sort of a value, what does it say? Oh, all it is, if I say any name and parentheses, it always thinks I'm trying to run something. So it's, wait a minute, now x is not a function. What are you, you daft? <laughs> all right, well, then certainly then with add num, as you know full well, I can just do that and it runs it. Okay, so we're, we're good with that. Now, as, as we were kind of approaching a moment ago, if I have this function inside of parentheses, so in order to run it, any function, if I have parentheses after it and whatever I want to have there, would you say that this then might run this anonymous function? Yes. And this is an imperative idea. When you approach JavaScript, you will be a complete Lee noob to others, you will be considered as such, potential. is that a harsh word for me to say? Uh, if you don't know this idea of closures. It's just that important. I'd like to put it out there. This is a mission critical idea, okay? So we now understand that we can have this object, which is a function, and then run. It doesn't even have to have a name. We can add X and then make it run. Why might I want to do that? Would you say that X 
is still taco in the global thing, global scope. If I ask about X, like right here, you see, I ran this and it said that there was an X and it said that X was doing this and it did other things and it had X as being equal to 100 for a bit. Has X been now polluted? Was there an X that said taco? It did say taco. Have we messed up taco and said now you're 100? X is still taco because of functional scope. Okay? Yeah, X got used on the inside there. It could have been called anything. It never conflicts in the least with what is on the outside. I guess, you know, by that same token, if we had that and we said, there's this uh, idea of Y, console log, how about X plus 5? Uh, no, excuse me, Y plus 5. What am I thinking here? Y plus 5. So I've just traded it out, but also, if you will, just tell me what X is as well. And run this throwing the number 100 in a Y. Now, as we recall, X had not been messed with, so X really is still equal to taco of the global, right? If I don't redefine X on the inside of this function, will it be able to go outside and say, hey, anybody know what X is called? And then the global says, yeah, man, I got X right here. It's called taco. And then it comes into this thing. Can I look to the larger container, so to speak, from inside of a function, which is this little boundary of scope? Can I take a look outside to whatever variables are on the outside? Like, I have never defined x inside of this function. You think it's going to be happy with this? And yes, it is. It knows about taco. This is dangerous, isn't it? I don't know. Is it dangerous? Consider, can you have n number of layers of this to which a function is yet inside of another, inside of another? It's like one of these Russian doll setups, you know? This inside of another, inside of a smaller and smaller and smaller, and there it goes. That's extremely frequent. Extremely frequent. So that we can have this little code, I don't want it to mess with the stuff outside, but I wanted to see that at least the next layer up or two or something, possibly even all the way out to the global set of things. So this concept is just of mission critical importance, and we get even further here in a moment here to understand better things about closures, actually, as it were. All right, we're in closing. Does, does anybody on the outside get to know what X as 100 is or Y as 100? Nobody. So it's enclosed, if you will. You can think about it like that, and then it's like, oh, it's a closure. I've encapsulated and enclosed it inside of this function. Thoughts? At this point, this is one of those areas in which, like, if this is mystifying at this stage, man, I want to make sure that we're good on this part before then a little bit of the next part, I guess, because we're going to return on a, a function that says something. Anybody? Uh, all right, we're there. We're ready. To, it's a function in a function time, then. It's time to then nest this thing. So we'll, we'll have a function, yes. Yes. Um, why do we use anonymous functions just to declare variables with them? Or An anonymous that? function, let's say that you are setting up uh, oh, Google Maps or something, and you'd like for there to be only a few names that are on the outside, and there is just like uh, the Google name is on the outside that you can get to all the other stuff from. Yeah. So we expose that at a global scope, but on the inside there's a lot of other stuff that makes it work, like tons and all of the rest of that is actually inside of a closure. It runs immediately, like once you load that script on the page, maybe we can even take a look at it as we load that in in a little moment here. Uh, take a look at the way that Google has chosen to put that all together. It runs immediately, sets up all of its deal, and then it says, you know, if there's a place that I should now init and start to call, then it just goes on and does more things, I guess. But then all of those gnarly variable names and stuff that Google has chosen are all stuck on the inside and they're tucked away from our code. We could name our things anything. It could conflict with Google's naming without any incident because their stuff is now encapsulated inside and then it has no conflict on our good stuff on the outside or other places and such. On the other ideas before we go and have a function returning a function. It's done. This is called, yes, yeah, still add known. It's boring as hell, isn't it? We already did that, didn't we? Well, okay, then it's gonna get better. Uh, what we're gonna do is actually, there's X, we're going to return another function, which is anonymous. And it will be uh, something which accepts a different value, y. And then that function will in turn return x plus y. And then we need to just conclude the one and conclude the other. And that's add num. It's a function which is inside of another function. We haven't really described too much of this return keyword yet, I guess. But as you might expect, like, what might it do? Close the loop. Closes it off. Well, a loop is a different idea slightly. Yeah, 
I oh, hope you don't mind me kind of clarifying that small aspect, but closes off this code block. It will conclude and will say, I'm done running. And if you do that a little premature, like there's a hundred more lines that could have been run, and yet, yet here it says return, well, okay, yeah, it does just cut out at that point. It does not run any additional lines that might exist. So it's a way to conclude it. Yes, it concludes that whole code block. Just poof, we're out. As well then, what can it do? Like if you're looking at this return x plus y, what might occur with this? That never gets run. Potentially it never gets run yet, or would it get run? I mean, this already returned. Well, wait a minute. But it's returning a function. If it returns a function, if I have in my hot little hand something which it built, <laughs> is that something which is code which can run? If I have asked the outer guy to build that function for me and it's returned one to me, which is the inner one that's highlighted now, well, could that then be run in the future? Absolutely. And actually, because a functional scope might the inside know what the outside x value is. Is it know about taco or does it know about whatever this, this, it, this x? What do you think? Isn't that beautiful? It's just because it's on the next layer up, it's like, well, I didn't find it inside my little world. I'm going to go to the next scope up. And then if it didn't find it there, by the way, then it would go to the next scope up as well. And it would keep on going and going until it found somewhere in which it found letter X. With this, all right, if I ask, please uh, do an add num of five. Really what that is, is it builds a function and returns it to me. You see how that looks like the inside guy? Well then, if I was to say that um, there's an add num of five and it's returning a function, if that is equal to a function, could I say please from this run whatever gets returned with another parameter? That's mind numbing, isn't it? Did that just bend your noodle in half? That's the goal of mine is all. <laughs> what might be easier, I guess, is an add five. Let's say var add five is equal to an add num of five. Does that make sense? Maybe that does. And if I say I'm going to run an add five, which is that inside function, which is with an x just absolutely stuck as five, it has built that thing out just to only know ever that x is equal to five. Y is still up for grabs. Like why? Please pass me something for y. I, I don't know what that is at all. If I don't pass it, then it's going to be trouble. Okay. If I just do that, it'll run it, but it'll be, uh, I don't know what you're trying to add here. It's nan means not a number. I don't understand this at all, is what it's trying to say there. Not a number, that's what that means. If I pass in uh, another number there then, okay. Then it's able to run that inside little function that was built out for us. How in the world is this gonna be useful in real life? Are you ready to live? <laughs> Are you ready to build out a web page? I mean, let's get crazy, I guess. Uh, first of all, I would encourage you just to be able to have, because repetition is the mother of all learning, and perhaps you'd like to run on a block. This is an, an exercise usually. I mean, the classes that we get into like this, there's a fair amount of thinking that could exist. Uh, you end up a little bit tired, more tired than you thought you might uh, often at the end of this kind of class, I hope. Uh, if not, then we can, we can get the, uh, the levels set more appropriately, potentially in terms of how the pace or whatever it is. Uh, anyway, I would encourage you now, some of you brought laptops and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Please, if you will, if you do not have a laptop, please get with a person who does have a laptop. You're working in pairs. I would encourage you, even if your neighbor also has a laptop, uh, get with them and just use one machine so it's a paired exercise in this way. You don't have to, absolutely, anything, literally anything that goes on in this room, aside from that which would offend another or be something illegal, God, in, in, aside from that, anything is possible to do inside of this room, and I do not mind. Again, so nothing illegal, please. Nothing which would offend another. That's it, that's class rule. God, you could be late, early, I don't give a shit. You know, it's all good. Anything you wanna do, just you be you, have that fun. But please, if you will then, pair up, and then please run this just so you're, you've typed it, and I think that by typing or writing it, it exercises additional like neurons in the brain. And then potentially, it actually gets retained a little better, is how that works out. We'll take five or 10 or something, get ice cream if you like, it's all good.
I apologize. I hadn't actually intended necessarily for that to be all. <laughs> just the others. I apologize, though. <laughs> oh, I didn't intend that those ice creams might have might have been a part of it. I apologize. Well, why did you do that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
chocolate and then let's regroup. We have about a minute left. Good time. Mm. Man, I definitely needed those calories. Add 
add five. A question is posed, what is add five? Who would like to answer that question based on seeing this? What is add five, anyone? It's a variable. Okay, it's a variable that points to? A function. A function. If I were to say, tell me about add five, I'll clear the screen here in a moment, then add, tell me what add five is. It was built out as being, please build it from that other closure thing. Well, let's see what the, there it is, that close, oh, come back, oh, okay, that. Build it out of this. So we said what, var add five is equal to add num of five, which means x is just pinned down as always being five. It can never be anything else because of how it then was built. Could I have one that is then called add 10 that is built on the same way? So say var add 10 is equal to add num of 10. Now, add 5 and add 10 look like the same thing. Like here's where the add 5 was. And I ask, tell me what add 10 looks like. And it looks exactly the same. But you and I both know secretly inside, it is baked inside that the number 5 or 10 is present. And that differentiates these two. Does that help to answer the question potentially? Yes, a bit. A little bit. I'm glad there's mystery that abounds. Ah, oh, if there were not, then why would we even have the passion and drive to seek and continue? Who knows? Maybe it would diminish, evaporate, and our lives would bland. What do you mean by being baked inside? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> baked inside is when you get hot boxed. No, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> Never mind. No, baked inside. It's uh, absolutely, as we build out the add five or the add 10 object, which is a function, yeah. that functional scope is then holding on to, because it was built inside of another function, it is holding on to whatever that other value of x was. If you recall, that's how this thing got all built out. And as we had started to run this guy, then always within these curlies, if I say that I add num of five, it can never be anything different that one that gets built just will always. And any other function, can you imagine that there could be return an array of five functions? Could that be a thing? Here it's just returning one. Like we're just trying to keep it simple initially, right? But consider, we could go nuts and we can have a, like an array of many and all of those separate individual loose functions because they're inside of the same curlies, they would know x is five. Could they internally redefine x for their own purpose and then forget what it was at that parent level? Yes, they could go and like trash that value and do anything they want inside. And then they will have forgotten what that original x is five idea was. They can set it to anything that they'd like and that's fine. It will not taint anybody else's experience with the, the x things. There will always be five for everybody else in that regard. These are all very good points, I believe. And this will help us, I hope, to be able to understand this next portion that we get into, I think. Anybody like HTML here? Nice, we have some hatred. Uh, white hot rage, it's uh, emerging right now. Yes. Somebody's uh, <clears throat> barfed a little in their mouth. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the HTML, that's all. They, they just really was a dislike, I think. There was a kind of a adverse reaction that existed. Let's just call it that. Please. I shouldn't describe too much more of that. Anyway, yes, we're going to get into some HTML. Anybody love HTML? Yeah, it's all right. Anybody like JavaScript yet? I mean, this class was really, I think the title was maybe billed as being uh, uh, actually like JavaScript, I think is the name of this, what it was at least. Was that the name of the class? It was actually, you said actually be happy with JavaScript. Oh, yeah. Actually be happy with JavaScript. And I changed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nobody's going to be happy with JavaScript. Screw that. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, anybody actually happy with JavaScript at this stage? Oh, okay, so it's a good thing you changed the name, I think. <laughs> she knows. This is good. We keep, you know, Kit Terry keeps us honest. <laughs> she is a sweetheart, honestly. Keeps us in a good place with that. So it is time then. Anybody hate uh, HTML? We, we've covered that there's maybe some people that do. Uh, what do we have? Do we get to do here? We'll make a directory. Now in your operating system, things might look starkly different, uh, but I'm just gonna make a directory that is actually something JavaScript. So you can pick whatever verb to, uh, or, or whatever you like about JavaScript. So it's the actually class. 
actually something. And so inside of here, there's nothing. If you were on a Windows machine, a similar effect could be had by doing something like you go over to the C drive, and then maybe you do, for Mictor, it's MD, and then you could call it whatever you want. And then you potentially, just like I've done a CD, that actually is the same. So you can then change directory into whatever it is that you had built. And then you can, to see the listing of files which are present, then you can just do that one, that DIR. And that'd be very similar then to the things that I had done where I made a directory, I changed into it, and I've seen that there's no files around. Like the LS didn't respond with a dang thing for me here. So I've got an empty folder kicking around. That's the whole thing. And maybe you want to do it from your own like explorer slash finder slash whatever. A GUI environment, you can make a folder that way. Or maybe you don't even care. That's cool too. Again, this is an entirely flexible experience here, and you can pick as you see fit. Uh, these things, incidentally, are being recorded just because there's um, uh, known that there's uh, one, one person here who is, is an arrest warrant out and we wanted to capture some of their feedback. Oh God, I've said too much already. No, it's actually just being recorded so you can actually do this again. Me with myself actually. This is in the... No, I'm just joking. Oh, my God. I'm just trying to keep you guys awake, I guess. I hope that you guys don't ever get bored of these antics. They are only antics. Whatever I'm doing up here is just silly anyway. With that, we have a folder at our disposal. You might have a text editor. If you were on a Windows machine, it just might be Notepad in which you can do something like index htm or something. That would be a valid thing on a Windows machine to try to do from a command prompt. Anybody have any questions if you're on a Windows machine about how to do these sorts of ideas and things? Making a file, being able to edit it. Notepad is a great little simple editor for text. And I have a similar sort of a very simple editor for text here. It's just this thing that's called Sublime. Please don't be uh, crazy about, oh my gosh, it's like looks so much different. No, we're just editing text. It's just only a text file, that's it that we're putting together here. So let's put together index, htm. You can also put an L on the end if you'd like. That's perhaps even more appropriate in most cases. However, uh, browsers do interchange and accept either way because uh, largely early days of this, uh, Microsoft machines couldn't have more than three letters of the extension. So people just took that concession and said, I guess we'll allow that there can be three letter extension of htm and that means html. So with that, everybody cool with editing a totally blank file? Put in here whatever you like, can't you? My goodness. Index HTM is what I've called that guy. It is time for us to put together a div. And even, let's give it an ID. We'll have it to be buttons. Now, if anybody likes HTML in the class, which of, of which I'm surprised nobody actually indicated they might, what does this do? Okay, a couple of people actually are on board with that. Anybody have an, a thought, like what might this do for us, having this div thrown out on the page currently? It's a little square that you can style up with font size and colors and whatever you want yeah. with the button, which at the moment is just a div, it's not a button, you need to make it a button. Okay, true. Uh, well, wait, then uh, I've said buttons, does that visibly appear on the page in any way, shape or form? No. Or am I mystified, like I render this and it's just totally a blank slate now? Okay, so I can refer distinctly to this div by utilizing its ID of buttons. Other thoughts about this? Anybody want to have further clarification on that idea? We're about to get out, have some JavaScript that gets a hold of this buttons thing and works with it. Anybody like HTML that you would want to not have to write it by this text editor? Like if I wanted to have a button in here that says like, input type is equal to button, value is equal to, that's about button for the number one. Really. All right, now that would put together a button, it would, and it's a number one, and I could push it, nothing much would happen, but I could push that button. Anybody wanna do that with JavaScript? No, let's all go home, nobody cares. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay, you're stuck with me, I guess. We're gonna do that, just because I believe it will help you out tremendously in the future and such. So let's put together now what would be some JavaScript, just with a simple script element. There's some of that. And let's say var buttons is equal to, somehow we'll get a hold of the buttons. Anybody have an idea of how that might happen? Somebody here might. I know that some probably do, and I hope that I'm not boring those that might know. Document get element by ID. 
in that exact casing. Here's another thing I didn't tell you about. JavaScript is ridiculously case sensitive. You cannot mess up any part of the uppers and lower case of things there at all. It is ridiculously, just as is Java and many other languages as well. Only I think VB script and VB are ones that would be very just throwing care to the wind about casing. Much of the computer world is extremely sensitive. In fact, isn't that weird that the G is not an uppercase? I mean, we have everything else. When it has a new word boundary, it starts off with an uppercase letter. Doesn't that just feel out of place? Even makes you feel a little bit like, ugh! Well, the reality on this then, it starts out with a lowercase because in the world of coding, often things which are classes start with an uppercase letter or interfaces and other things like that. However, things that can run uh, or, or whatever, functions, methods, uh, they start with a lowercase letter or other variable name. So we've been keeping that rule so far we have everything like letter X and letter Y and add num. It started with a lowercase letter, if you recall. The reason being then, those function names and such, that's best practice. If we had something that's uh, more, it's a template that can build other things, that's a class. If it's defined as being this structure is able to do more, okay, that's like an uppercase letter for the start. So that's how you know now what, uh, what the uppercase letter things are. With the buttons, let's now put in additional button that'll be a neighbor for this. So we can say var new button is equal to document create element that is an input. And then we'll say how about uh, buttons append child that new button. Golly, it's a lot of typing to get a button on. It doesn't even have a number on it. It's so weak. Ah! Nobody else shares my frustration. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Just gonna sit here. <laughs> um, how about we say that also new button value is equal to two? I mean, that'd be cool. All right. so that's a bunch of stupid ass code. I had actually started to put together the thing by which, like, if you're on the same Wi Fi network as I would be, that you could get all of my code for free, like it would show up and you just copy paste that stuff around. I, I think I'll do that for our next session for those who actually might not be completely offended by this session. Maybe you'll come back for more, and if you do, maybe it's only because of the ice cream, actually, but anyway, you probably actually then want to like copy-paste a lot of things around, I guess. Wouldn't it be great, like, I show up next time, and I don't have Jack Diddley, and I'm right here, and I can even, let's say, screen's busted, and that's a real, like, we try you guys and see if you actually care about JavaScript and stuff. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Just like the next time around, kind of prove out who's actually gonna make it to the third session or whatever, and then the third session we have, like, this lobster and stuff, <laughs> it's just really, the spread is just nuts. Okay, I've, I've been dawdling. I hope that some people have been typing as we're <laughs> going for this here. Let's see if any part of this does anything at all. If I save this out, uh, and it could be that some people are still getting caught up, for which I apologize if I'm jumping the gun on this. I guess I'll try to keep both things visible on the screen at the same time. Oh, there's the ice cream comic. That's a good one. The ice cream man is coming. <laughs> oh my gosh. Stupid Reddit comics. Uh, where was that other? Actually, I'll just use this actually. Uh, file. And you can go over. Uh, where was I in? Actually, ah, it's so annoying to try to figure all that out. How do I just do open index HTML? That's a whole lot easier. It just does that. File, and there's all my pathing to it. And, and then there it is. I have something screwed up apparently. There's the number one button. Oh, but the number two, it looks like not a button at all. <laughs> well, why is that? Anybody have an idea? Oh, you don't have a second. Okay, let's find out more. This is great. We get to do some troubleshooting for those who might not have had a similar experience. So there was the code again, by the way. Some thoughts. Our guy, Harry. You said it was an element in there. You didn't specify the type, so I guess it's a default oh, type. Yeah, the default thing is a text box. Okay, so I had to say the type is button. Uh, but some people might have not even received that second button at all. Possibly the number one button had arrived, possibly, but the number two button, not so much. Well, let's get a little couple of these things cleaned up, I guess, what, like, uh, maybe it's best to have that before that. Uh, new button type is equal to button. Uh, if that had not shown up for you, it's possible that some nutty things like maybe the E of element of create element or whatever is not, or uppercase, or it could be a pen child is not a perfectly whatever done thing or whatever. Let's take a look at your code though. I mean, maybe, maybe it's something else.
Could be more though, hopefully, you know. It, it might never work, you never know. Wouldn't that be a thing? Let's now add in a loop to make a lot of buttons. In fact, uh, do I wanna have to have written out any sort of HTML in the first place? You guys took it on faith that perhaps it was gonna work and I thank you for it. Uh, now I'm going to remove this input type button, that whole HTML version of this thing, relying solely on JavaScript to populate 10 buttons in total inside of this div. How could I do so? Ah, after having gotten a hold of this buttons, I can now use some sort of a loop. Anybody have an idea about what flavor of loop might be appropriate? A, a four. Yeah, we don't necessarily have four each without doing other tricks with like jQuery or things. So at our disposal, uh, well, older browsers might not have, newer browsers actually will have on that. But uh, let's just do a very simple, the old school for loop. And this is annoying as all heck because we now have three things inside of here separated by semicolons. We always, with a for loop, we always have three parts in there. These three parts have the first part that runs just the very first time that kind of sets the stage. This is like a preamble. This is like, let's get things prepared. Then it gets into, uh, well, what should I end with? How far should I go with this thing? And then the final piece is, uh, what do I do to be able to go to the next? So consider, if I was looping through this, maybe I'll have some sort of a variable. Like I'll say X starts off as being just one. And then I want to say, I want to go up at the point that X is 10, but no further, uh, just to be able to make sure that there's 10 of them. So like X is less than or equal to 10 might be good for that. And then finally, well, what do I do every single time to be able to move to the next? Any ideas about how to, well, plus one is a great idea. So we'd actually say then something like x is equal to x plus one. So those could be the three things that I would wedge in on this for loop. It's probable that some of you have seen this kind of a format because this shares so much commonality with Java and C and C++. It's exactly the same idea over in those other languages. Love it. So that's where we got these ideas from. I'll go ahead and now put that in. We start off and really to actually play by the rules, what keyword might I have prior to utilizing a variable? Var. Oh, the var keyword is necessary here as well. I mean, otherwise I'm actually putting that out on the global scope and that might not be a great idea. So var x equals a one, and then I go up until x is greater than 10. So this is, what do I consider to be let's keep going? The idea that if it equates to true, I'm gonna keep the show on the road. That is x less than or equal to 10. And then what do I do every single time? x is equal to x plus one. There's a shortcut for that last one that we'll see in a moment, but in the simplest format, then maybe that's a good idea then putting that all together. At the end, now this will open up a code block. We had already seen that function was making use of these curlies so that it could say this next section is gonna be my stuff. This is gonna be a code block that I run. So it's similarly then the for loop defines the scope by which it would operate. Do we have the same idea of like as a function, we said that the variables that would be like hard coded inside this x equals five or x equals 10 idea. Is there scoping for these loops? I mean, it looks similar in the sense of those curlies, but is it a function? It's not a function. So wait a minute, had we said actually previously the only way, maybe, maybe recall the only, the only way to be able to have it that you can kind of carve out and have this area by which these variables will be distinct is through functions. So this is not like a place in which I am going to be preserving and, and uh, kind of excluding. In fact, after the end of the loop, I'm just curious perhaps in terms of proving that out, uh, perhaps I would like to see, you set up that loop. So totally after and outside of the for loop altogether, can I console log x? just out of curiosity to see what that might be. And would it exist? If Lauren's words hold true, which weirdly, occasionally they actually might, not often probably, but anyway, if they do hold true, would we expect the number 10 here? Anybody have a, a vote? What might you expect that X might be at that stage? Ten. Let's see if it just might be 10. It keeps going from one to 10. Which do you, what do you think? Nine. 
possibly nine is what we're going to end up with. So because ten, then well, yeah, I don't know. Let's see what we get. What, what do you think? So we will get the loop to have the numbers one through ten happen inside. Yes, I like this. Oh, but afterwards, what was the condition by which it said, I'm done here? In order for it to bail as such. So it's less than equal to 10? So then that means it's going to be 11 is a vote that we have. Hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. Let's see what happens. I like that a whole lot. I'm going to clean up this other nonsense that I had over there. Uh, what do we have? This uh, loop goes on, and we're repenting the child every time. And, oh, instead of it being a number, why don't we just have it to be whatever x is? But we want to convert it maybe to a string. Actually, we're just going to say it's x just for the moment. I don't want to go too crazy. This is a lot of new code. This is already a lot of fun. So uh, that's cool. Let's see if we get ten buttons out there, numbered one through ten, as it might be. I've saved out that script to be able to have it still visible for those who might be typing. I'm just going to scroll. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to put that on one line, I think, and take away some of this extra space. This just so it is actually other people can keep typing as we're moving forwards here down here. Refreshing the page. Okay, I do get one through ten. Where do I see console log stuff emerge? In the actual console. Okay, in the console, accessible by right-clicking and doing inspect. There's one. And inside of that console, Go to this little console tab thing. Oh yes, you had it. Number 11 has been represented. Okay, everybody see why that might then have been. All right, uh, part of this, by the way, we came here, yes, to learn for loops, that's cool. But also part of this is that we wanted to also learn a little bit further about these closures. Now, as I punch these buttons, like nothing, absolutely nothing happens yet. Let's make it so that we are putting together uh, in the console, we'll just console log out what the numerical button number was down below then. To do this, a trick to know about is that buttons can have what happens when I click. There's the old school way and now the pro way to go about this. The old school way might be just on click is equal to a function, an anonymous function. And then what happens is I can just like console log, uh, maybe how about whatever x is. Now, would you think that as I click the button, it might write out the actual number? I mean, x is going from 1 to 10. We're creating these buttons as we roll along. What number might you expect to have present every time I click a button? Is it A? the actual button's face value, numbers 1 through 10, as it were, or is it number 11 every single time? What do you think? I don't think it's going to be 11 because it doesn't end the loop yet. Ah, so are we still in the loop, technically? Thank you so much for joining. Are we still, do we know about the number? Let's find out. So we will now rerun this guy. It doesn't look a whole lot visibly different. And I'll get some more real estate available now for us. We get to understand why we might care about closures when every flip in one of these guys is their number 11 every single time. Why? Because it is after the loop had run. Had the loop run at the time it was complete, by the time that I start mashing buttons around, me being a very slow human as I am, I mean, it's actually slow more than others, in some cases about that. Okay, that's me as a human, as human as I am. It takes me seconds at the very best. And meanwhile, the system has literally done billions of things in that time frame. Prior to me having any inclination to just hit it as fast as I possibly could. Billions of things have gone on inside this chip. Amazing. So it definitely has run the for loop. I mean, it's way past done in the run of the for loop. That thing has been 11 for a long time. To the machine, it seems like an eternity. That thing's been set in XX is equal to 11. All right, then how can I do something in which we'll actually log the appropriate value of x as an idea? Ooh, now I, you walked right into that one, huh? Raise your hand at the right time on this. Ah, uh, you're, you're good, sir. You got this. Instead of it being, now, wasn't it that, like, functions have the scope and then they always hold on to the number or whatever that is? Isn't that a thing? Maybe? Could it be a thing? Well, wait a minute then. Have I, though, passed in what x is right here? See, man. 
Would that be good enough? What do I need to do? I actually have to run something that returns a function. I have to bake it in somehow. How do I actually use a closure in the, in the form in which it actually gets baked in? I can run this thing by having, if you recall this format, oh, maybe I can put that x over here, and then I, I have the onclick is equal to whatever that is, and run it. But do I yet want to run it, or do I want to run when the button is actually clicked? I want to run it when the button is actually clicked. So this function, which runs right now, needs to do return another function inside that takes whatever x is, or we can call this anything. We'll see that in a moment. We can actually call that anything we want. That might be confusing. Confusing to call it. Let's call it x2. It's actually just whatever you want to call it. Honestly, it's like it will utilize that. Uh, all right, actually, wait a minute. Am I thinking properly? I might actually be thinking completely incorrectly. And my apologies, my sincere apologies. That is where we might want to put that guy. Yeah, I, thank you for being patient with my little foibles on occasion. Huh, as human as I am. And what about that? So we are returning a new function. Any sort of a statement of which return is a statement would have a semicolon afterwards. Let's now pick through this thing and try to understand it. As you put the cursor, this little insertion point, the flashing little carrot guy, at that opening parenthesis, note that it's balanced right there, this closing parenthesis right there. So on click is going to equal to whatever this thing is when it runs. True? I will say that on click will get that, whatever, whatever happens. And it runs right now. It runs right now, and it has the value of x at what point? Is it x equals 11 or x is equal to 1 through 10? This be during the loop that these it's things each one. Uh, if it's after this curly, then it has become 11 at that stage. Yes, that's correct. And then if I'm referring to x prior to that, well, before we had it that on click was going to say, run this whenever the user clicks. And so that on click actually then gets executed whenever that the user is chosen. I'm going to mash that button now. This is why we had seen 11 surface. In fact, I haven't refreshed that page. If we go across here, here we are then again, you know, on the, on the one in which it only ever just knows about 11 is all. All right, back here then, we are passing in and we're gonna console log this new value, x2. We're gonna say that we have a function that's going to take in something. It returns another function that console logs this internal thing, this scoped value of whatever x2 means. But we have now passed in to this inside guy, and to have baked into this thing, we've passed in our number 1 through 10 version of x. That's the trick of it all. That's the cool trick of it all. This is the one, I believe, that uh, now that we're getting nigh into time to wrap this thing up, we have four minutes until the official conclusion of this. Isn't it fun how fast time might fly when you're having fun? Are you? Are you? Not having fun, are you? <laughs> I see that. Oh, I wish I was having fun! <laughs> I love you! <laughs> I love this class! <laughs> because you guys are both face honest, and that's a thing I appreciate sincerely. What I'm gonna do, <laughs> thank you for playing along with that one, by the way. <laughs> that's a good one. I'm gonna do the Ghostbuster symbol here and be able to clear the screen up. And then as I press these things, the number five, the number eight, the number three, the number four, it's really appropriately working. And all of this then is because of the closure. Now, is it starting to get real, potentially? Now, I know this is not beautiful. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't want to like try to sell this code to somebody. We're just getting our training wheels on is all. My gosh, then, as an instructor's standpoint, and having seen a lot of people go through like a lot of fun with JavaScript and such, I would like to impress upon you that just this key thing alone, if you've gotten this today, if you start to understand this, I would encourage you to take a look online and try to seek out that code of which functions are like immediately running. There you know, like if there is a function, this is, you know, this is an anonymous function kicking around. And if that thing has then curlies or uh, parentheses after, you know this thing is running right now. And the pro thing about that is if it's running right now, it has the great potential to bake inside of it values, as it were, to be able to use later. We're passing in X. We could have passed in a lot of things. We just passed in X. 
This could have still been called x. I think that would have confused you, really. But here, it's bringing in whatever x is equal to at the time. It has run 10 times. So literally, how many functions do we have kicking around? We have 10 distinct functions attached, each one of them attached, to those buttons, those 10 buttons. Any, any part of that starts to make sense, great. If not, it's cool. Do you ever have to have working code? This is an inter another interesting concept. I think I'll conclude with this because it's perhaps the most important thing that I'll tell you. What if the code never works? What do you, what, what's the risk of that, potentially, as an average person who might like to get things done on occasion? Is there, is there any risk you think, my code, I don't know, it's just never working. What's your impression about that thought? Do you care? Sorry. <laughs> Why do you care? Why do I care about? About having working code. Because if I have a task that I want done, being able to have a working code would be useful. Okay. Because it does. Eventually. <laughs> easy. Can you imagine if you had held yourself to this sort of a standard? In fact, creating this idea that it might be good or bad to have working or not working code and assigning that sort of an idea to it. No, no, I don't think it's wholly bad. Okay. I think, especially for learning. So you're saying it's bad if it does work? No. My gosh, I would give you a high five if you had said that, though. <laughs> I would indicate, this, the reason that I go down this road and start to indicate this interesting what in the hell is going on thought, you know, in your brain that you're having right now, like he's saying that it doesn't even matter if it ever works. It will keep you going in the literal, frequent time frames in which things are like broken beyond recognition for weeks at a time sometimes. As you approach coding, it's unlike many other sort of uh, areas of study in that there's not as easily measurable a percentage of completion or an understanding of time frames, um, a recognition of cost. Uh, it, you might have heard about a lot of things that just completely go over budget that are code related and there are some real key reasons for this and then people have like spent their whole life trying to organize and better uh, better figure out how that can be approached and then just have more repeatability reliability around the whole product uh, and such in, in the process of coding I would invite you to step back from many of your expectations you might have at this point and then the, the risk, the sincere risk that it might be to say it's uh, bad if it doesn't work. That's the, that's the risk. Even to the point, if you celebrate when it does work, I guess that's cool. But the problem is, if you do that, then that, uh, that celebration leaves with it like a drug. Now you need to have an increased or a continuation of that high to be able to have just like, all right, we're cool or whatever. Maybe you've, uh, you've been in, in some sort of a situation in the past in which you put forth your best effort and it was recognized, but then everybody expected that to be always the same thing always or something. And I would indicate that that's an interesting risk with coding, surprisingly. What I would impress upon you is we code just because we can, and actually, weirdly, even if that stuff never works, we're still coders and we code because we can. Let's just stay in the game. I mean, it's fine if it works, and it's fine if it doesn't work. That's a powerful place to be in. And that will honestly keep you going through rough spots in which you're frustrated thinking, why the doesn't this thing work? And that can be a somewhat common experience. I mean, anybody have a lot of those experiences to this point then, even to the point you think, and you start to wonder, the human starts to wonder at least, I have all this missed opportunity that had I been able to have working code, perhaps this project and so forth, and then this mind keeps going into the, what I would indicate are not so helpful paths. What I would like to press upon you is, it is beautiful and perfect just to pivot as you see fit. You are the prettiest girl at the party, is the situation on this. Does that make any sense? Now, I'm not trying to have some sort of a sexist thing emerge from this. All I'm trying to say, prettiest person at the party, put, put in however you might want to feel about it. But often, you go to a, a party scenario, and some people, some beautiful people, are highly sought after in that scenario. You go into any hackathon, you go into any sort of an, an environment in which there's a lot of project managers, they are desperate to the point of, oh my God, you know anything about code? Oh, can I get you fun? Oh my God. <laughs> it is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. Literally, if you've never had that experience as a coder, I expect you will the very first time that you might go to any sort of a hack-related event, any sort of a, a thing that has to do with code. So what I would indicate is, 
Let's just celebrate that we can code. I mean, if so many people go so amped about us somehow occasionally stringing something together that sort of works halfway, that apparently is worth a lot. People are extremely patient about wanting to get things done. And there possibly some people in the room would identify that it is very tricky. Hurting cats, have you ever heard of that one? I mean, to try to get people moving in a similar direction to achieve goals, software-related goals, it is atrocious at times. So to be able to keep yourself from going nuts and also to just maintain that, oh my gosh, man, there's opportunity galore. Yeah, own the thought if you can. Like, it never has to work. Never, ever, ever has to work. We could because we can. All right, if it doesn't work, there's so many other languages and opportunities. And I want you to find something that you're fired up about. And honestly, to not care nearly as much as you're inclined to care normally. Especially when you get behind those keys. Oh, there's other cases in life if you want to share those. Cool, I don't care. <laughs> That's fine. But very specifically with code, do not let it get the best of you in thinking that you're weak and such. Hey, let's just know that we're human. And code has this weird perfection about it that's eerie and dumb all the same time. Thank you very much, each, for being able to join us today. I hope then potentially there will be a possibility that we could identify new things that we study or whatever it is. If you guys have a passion, there's some talk about Rails and such. If there's other technologies and such, just talk about Python a little bit. Now, oh, great. Let's have fun, man. I mean, this, this facility is gorgeous. It is a great one. A little warm in the summer. It's all right. <laughs> this is a beautiful place. And so I want very much that we would utilize a space with such high quality so that we can achieve nice things. It's a very comfortable be able to bring friends, etc. Let's organize. I don't know. I can't do this kind of a thing much more than once a month, honestly. But hey, let's have some fun. Uh, with that, thank you each. I believe we still have like ability to communicate after this thing. Uh, Terry has maybe, if, how many people would want to be like on some sort of a mailing idea somehow about this? We can send out a mail by which you can then get somehow involved in a group for those who might be interested. The same participants that have been part of this. Thank you guys so much. I didn't need to get over back to the family, and I'm glad so much that we had this opportunity. If anybody wants to hang out and code for a little while, I do have a few moments. I'll just pack up a few things. Thank you guys so much. Thank for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Especially with Python as well, because um, some of my Python friends. Python the same? It's in a way. It's got, it's got a nickname of the weaponized suit. Oh, okay. uh, what is it called? Weaponized suit. Okay. <laughs> Feel pretty easy. I quite like it. But um, yeah, I think JavaScript has that thing as well, where if you want to learn something, just ignoring the nuances of some languages like, I don't know, maybe you're using C, but you can do your menu management yourself, or C you have to do. Or all that more. It's good to use Java because you only have to write up the content that you care about. So let's say a C sample for example, by moving that sample. Maybe you need to learn a certain gen, maybe you need to load it correctly, or maybe you load it incorrectly. So now your solution doesn't work, so it's hard to learn. I think JavaScript is good because it's pretty good. Apart from JavaScript. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of working. And if something goes wrong, it's because what you're learning has gone wrong. Not that you've done something silly with language. But that's not to say that JavaScript is bad. Yeah, it can get pretty messy. I mean, I've seen some tools that have worked. Isn't that great? And that's an achievement in the sense you know what does not work. And that's a very important thing. 